The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the work that we're doing at NIST on uh, 3D printing with uh, cement and concrete. Uh, so I'm going to kind of divide this up into two parts here. So the first part is going to be talking a little bit about the, the paste printing and the paste formulation studies we did. And then we'll get into a little bit of how we think we can use that information to scale up to the mortar and concrete scale. Uh, so I'll just jump right in here. So uh, the project at NIST on 3D printing is focused a lot around developing the measurement science tools, that's the words we like to use, to uh, enable this process. So that gets into everything from like the material science aspects of it, looking at the you know, formation of microstructures and how that relates to uh, rheological measurements, uh, to the processing side of things, uh, scaling up to paste and mortar and concrete, understanding how we can make measurements of the material at that scale and how it relates to 3D printing. And then finally, we take all that information and we help form consortia that we then transfer that uh, technology to the industry. So that's sort of the broad uh, picture of what we're trying to do here. Uh, today, I'm just going to focus on the, the middle part here, the standard test methods that we're, we're starting to work on. Um, and that's kind of going to form the bulk of our the talk here today. Uh, all right. So one of the first things we did in the lab was to think about what it is we, we want to 3D print. And so prior to this 3D printing project, we were working with a, a, a high volume limestone cements project. And that kind of laid the groundwork for our 3D printing uh, effort. And so what we did is we took some of the, the paste formulations from that study and we used them to uh, really get into our 3D printing work. So here we're kind of targeting a, a two hour open time or printability time. Uh, and this is the, the formulations here where we're, we're using, uh, taking uh, cement and replacing it with limestone at a 50% mass fraction. And then we're also varying the content of these three different limestones in our mixtures. Uh, and with each, uh, each mix here, you know, we're, we're keeping the uh, water content solid, the admixture content solids, and the water to powder ratio um, constant as well. And really what we're doing is when you look at it, we are controlling the surface area. Uh, available surface area in the powder and that really comes out of this uh, uh, realization here where in the first you know about four hours of hydration if we normalize our our isothermal calorimetry curves by the available surface area they all sort of collapse onto each other which tells us that at the very early ages which is the time scale that's interest for 3d printing our hydration kinetics are controlled by the available surface area so we're this is one way that we're maintaining uh, you know rheological control in terms of the, the kinetics is by controlling the surface area by burying the, the limestone. And that's kind of what I'm showing here. And we, we can kind of uh, reemphasize re this point here with these mixtures B and C, which have very similar surface areas and uh, a slightly different uh, particle size, uh, D50, and then the particle shape, uh, particle distribution looks uh, slightly different. So we're trying to make the point that the surface area is really what's uh, uh, playing a, an important role here. So moving on, uh, so that was the, the, the material side. So now we have our materials, so how are we gonna print it? So this is a very brief snapshot of our paste uh, cement printer. It is a, uh, a modified version of just an open sourced uh, polymer fused uh, filament fabrication printer, your typical printers you see that print plastic parts. Uh, so the, the main things to point out here is you take the, uh, the hot end extruder off and you add this, this pump. It's a progressive cavity pump. It's, uh, they call it a low shearing pump, but you know, that's a relative term. Really the, the point is, is that the cement paste travels through these, uh, this uh, cavity here in these, in these nodes and then it goes through the pipe and extruded out through our nozzle. That's so shown schematically there. This is the actual setup. So we mix our paste Prior to adding it to the pump, we add the material into this hopper here, and then it's pumped through uh, the, this hose down to the nozzle. And that's all controlled by the computer using, or the, the control hardware on the 3D printer. Um, and you generate the commands, the G-code commands, using uh, conventional slicing software. Uh, and so this is the structure that we were 
trying to print. It's just a, a tall, thin structure. We decided to do this uh, so that it was unstable, so we could see how many filaments that we could stack on top of each other before we got a problem. Uh, and then this is our filament cross-section geometry, just sort of a, like an elongated type oval or rectangle with semicircles on the end of it. Uh, so we have our material, we have our printer, so what's the test that we're going to do? Uh, so we first started out, uh, this is one of the first builds we did and kind of the first thing we really learned, that the way you create the structure, meaning how the robot moves, matters. Uh, so we first printed this you know, tall structure using these, this kind of procedure where we move from one direction, go up, back to the other direction, go up and continue back and forth uh, in this procedure. And this is the result that we got. And you can see that's not very good. It wasn't a desirable uh, result here. And really the problem comes down to the starts and stops at the end of the filament. That's a difficult thing for the printer to do. So to get around that, we changed the way the robot is programmed, and we now do this continuous type extrusion where we move and we're just zigzagging up to create our final structure, and our results are much better. Um, and so for our case here, we are printing uh, 25 layers. Uh, the, the width of this structure is uh, 45 millimeters. We're extruding one single filament of, uh, I think it's what I have, four millimeter width here. And we're going at a feed rate of uh, 13 millimeters cubed per second. So it's on the faster side. Um, but that's the, the parameters for our, our test that we're doing. Uh, and so this is some of the results. So for mixture A, which is, uh, we get this. <laughs> This is the first uh, print that we were able to achieve, and you can see it's not a very good one. <laughs> so the material is uh, freestanding for a few layers. Uh, there's lots of air voids in the system, um, and the print quality is just generally poor. Uh, as time goes on, and this is again time after mixing, so this is you know hydration time, 60 time, 60 minutes after water makes contact with cement. Um, we see uh, a slight improvement. Uh, we can stack more layers, and this is because this hydration continues to yield stress, the material increases, but we still generally have a, a poor quality print. <laughs> um, and this is, again, dealing with difficulties with the starting and stopping. Uh, going in, again, continuing, moving on. Uh, five minutes later, we're printing more uh, layers. Uh, hydration's happening, and its uh, yield stress is building up quite rapidly now. And then at 70 minutes, uh, we get we start getting this feature. So the we start getting like a narrowing of the filament. So you're not exactly printing the full length that the robot was told to print. Um, and then we start to see these uh, these types of uh, collapses of the structure at the top. Uh, and then oh, that's all the one I should have. I think I'm the slide there. Anyway, uh, so for mix B is the next mixture. Uh, uh, this has two different limestone formulations in it, so the, the rheology is, is quite different. I'll talk, get into that a little bit better. But uh, we're now printing, the first print is at 30 minutes, so we're, we're now printing sooner after we mix. Uh, we don't have the issue with the air bubbles, and the, the general print quality looks much better. Um, and in this case here, we're stacking the number of layers, and we get this collapse uh, shown over here. And this collapse is a result of the the uh, exceeding the yield stress of the first layer. So this is just due to the stacking the number of layers and you can't support it anymore, and it falls over. Uh, continuing on, we're now at 40 minutes. Uh, we start to see an interesting kind of behavior here where we can st stack more layers on top of each other, but now we start to see this uh, kind of combined buckling effect here where the nozzle's uh, imparting a, a moment on the top of the structure and you either get you know, collapse initiating somewhere down here, but this is now starting to indicate that our failure mode is going something that's you know, solely the rheology driven to something that's now more driven to the, uh, like a buckling type failure. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and then again, uh, continuing printing on, uh, you know, 47 and 55 minutes, we see uh, similar type behaviors. We can stack slightly more layers, but as we're adding more layers, this buckling behavior becomes more of an important uh, player in the failure of the structure. Uh, and then finally, the end of the printing here, uh, the yield stress and viscosity have reached a point where it's just not compatible with our system. The pump has difficulties running, which results in these air bubbles, and then just the general uh, consistency of the material is poor, and we start to get these structures that have very poor print quality, and then eventually it ends when you're just extruding material and it, it just makes a mess. So 
Um, this is what we call the end of the print, so we're about 80 minutes, you know, when we reach this point. Uh, so finally, print C, uh, mix C, uh, we see a similar behavior that we have to mix B, and that's again because we're making these two mixtures, B and C, to have similar surface areas, and so we get a similar uh, performance in the, in the building. So we were able to print at a slightly uh, earlier time, but again, the structures uh, look much the same, the failure modes are the same, and the end result is we get these kind of spaghetti looking structures. So we have, you know, we've, we've printed with some material, we've got some good results, so now we want to say, you know, what measurements of these materials can we make to relate back to these results. So one of the first things we, we looked at was looking at the, measuring the yield stress. So we did this using a simple strain controlled uh, rheometer. We put our material, uh, so we made a batch of material, we place it off to the side, and then we sample from it at given time points, and we put it in the rheometer. Uh, we run at a shear rate of point, uh, one per second, and we get curves that look like this. The top maximum peak here becomes our yield stress. We do this as a function of our mixing time from mix start. Uh, and we see these, uh, this is the yield stress for the mix A, the worst performing, and this is mix B and C. You see they're, they're very close to each other. So again, that's the surface area we're using to control the rheo rheology uh, at this point. Uh, so with that yield stress data, we can apply some sort of analysis to our results. Uh, the first thing we can do at the very early ages, before we get into that buckling effect, we can uh, try to estimate you know, the number of layers or the time to the first uh, failure. And when we go through, get the, you know, this is the stress that's applied to the first layer. That's how it's related to the yield stress. And then we can see for mixtures A and B, we can calculate a time of 11 minutes. Uh, that's when we should be able to print our first structure for mix A, but we weren't able to do that for 50 minutes. Uh, for mix B, we should have been able to do it right away, but it took about 30 minutes to do it. So that was an interesting result. And then uh, moving on as hydration continues, your this type of analysis becomes less important and we have to do an analysis that gets in more like the buckling behavior of the, of the structure, but we're not going to talk too much about that today except to say that we need to take account for it. Uh, so why is it that we, we don't, we can't, you know, we estimate that this is when we should be able to print, but we can't until here. So we try to do another test uh, using the rheology to measure the structural rebuilding of the material. So here, you know, you're shearing it, it's being sheared going through the pump, it's being sheared coming through the nozzle. So after that shear is removed, how long does it take for the material to get back to its uh, uh, yield stress at that time? And so we do this test by taking, this, again, our sample material, it's held off to the side, we put it in the rheometer, we shear it at a known strain rate for a number of seconds, and then we apply a, uh, a stress to it at in this case, it was 10% of the measured yield stress from the previous test, and we measure the, the decay of the strain rate as we're applying that stress. And when we do that, we can fit a model to it, and when we look at this data parameter here, plot that as a function of hydration time, and we start to see that at about a theta of 0 .1, uh, 0 0.125, anything below that is when we're starting to see principal structures. So that's kind of giving us an indication of when we can print and sort of complementing that yield stress measurement as well. Uh, so I'm kind of running a little long on time here, so I'll go through this quickly. So, you know, that was all good on the pace scale, but the objective here is to get to mortar and concrete. So how are we going to do that? Well, we've done a lot of work in the past in our lab on uh, simulating the flow of mortars and pipes and rheometers, and this is the approach that we've taken. We're uh, it's a smooth particle hydrodynamics approach where we're accounting for uh, lubrication forces between these particles. So in this case here, I'm going to present some results of just this simulation flowing in a pipe. Um, so what we do is we take, a, take these spheres, they're in a pipe, uh, we then assign rheological properties of a matrix fluid in between the spheres, uh, and then these are just fine details, but basically in our code we can, you know, clump a lot of these uh, particles together to create larger aggregates. Uh, and when we do this, we try to validate it with uh, some rheological measurements as a function of the volume of these spheres, we can see that we can fit very, uh, we can fit that uh, experimental measurements very well. So we're going to take this approach and apply it uh, going forward. So this is our pipe flow simulation where we're looking at a, a water to cement ratio of 0.48 of one millimeter sand in a three centimeter pipe. And so the, one of the first things we did is we do, we apply a pressure to the, to the ends of the pipe and get the velocity profile 
of the spheres as a function of their position. And we do this for a number of different applied pressures. And when we do that, we see the velocity scales to the applied pressure to the one over n, where n is your power law exponent of your material. So from this, this tells us that we can now, with two pressure measurements in a pipe, we think we can back out a power law behavior of our fluid. So that's one way that we think we can get some sort of inline measurement uh, of this in the, uh, in the field. So that's all the computer's telling us. Our next step is to try to validate this in the lab. Um, but uh, this code also tells us, uh, it also is able to incorporate uh, lubrication layer effects and uh, uh, particle migration effects, which we think may have some implications for durability. So you can imagine if you're extruding a filament of material, you see at the end of your filament, you have a very high water cement ratio versus towards the middle, you have a very low water cement ratio. So your uh, material properties get different across your extruded filament. Um, and the other point, the point to make here is uh, uh, this sort of flow pattern develops over about four to five pipe diameter. So that's the length of pipe you need to, to reach an equilibrium state. Uh, so that's some of the results that we have. I'll just briefly click through these. This is kind of a bit of our vision of how we go from laboratory to field. And it basically involves, you know, continuing to understand, you know, fundamental measurements that apply to measurements that we do in the laboratory, that apply to measurements that we do in the field. Uh, codes and standards are certainly going to be important. Uh, the inline measurements I measured talk a little bit about pipe flow simulations. There's a lot to do with machine design, robotics, and reinforcements. And then finally, consortiums, which if you're all are interested, I'll make an ad a quick advertisement here for our consortium. We're accepting members now to study these types of problems. And also for, uh, we also have the NRC postdoc program at NIST for graduates that uh, if you're interested in studying not only 3D printing related stuff, but hy hydration modeling and rheological modeling are active areas that we're working on. So if you're interested in any of these, come talk to me afterwards. And there's also a 3D printing committee at 1.30 this afternoon. So come to that too. So thank you.